I'm David Levi Strauss, Chair of the Graduate Program in Art Criticism and Writing here at the School of Visual Arts. Um, this is a first in our fall series of lectures. On October 14th, Lynn Tillman will um, speak about commenting on one medium through another. On November 18th, Peter Sheldahl will answer the question, at a time when art is being publicly gamed to exhaustion, can we still or again speak sensibly of what we like about it deep down? And on December 16th, Katie Siegel will talk about her new book, Since 45, America and the Making of Contemporary Art. Uh, all of these lectures will also be available for viewing on our new website, which is going to launch on Monday. Um, and everything will be up there after that. The summer before last, Amiel Akhle came to the Bard MFA program, where I also teach, to give a talk. Uh, I've been reading Amiel's poetry, fiction, translations, and essays for a long time, but I hadn't heard him speak uh, publicly for a while. And I was struck by a number of things he said. Rejecting the hidden pieties of art for art's sake, avant-garde writing in America, he argued for the importance of, quote, writing wherein something is actually at stake. And he talked about the exposure of the coming to consciousness, which is politics, as far as I can tell, he said. Because of the nature of our times, a lot of Amiel's work has involved acts of recovery. In his book, After Jews and Arabs, he recorded the, he recovered the history of complex relationships between Jews and Arabs in the Mediterranean and in the Middle East through constitutive literary, political, social, and historical moments. In Memories of Our Future, he explored the forgotten histories of the relation between poetics and politics in Israel, in Israel and the Levant, in the Paris of Edmond Jabez and Jacques Derrida, and in Sarajevo. And as the impetus behind the CUNY Poetics Document Initiative, he has overseen the recovery of significant writings by new American poets like Amiri Baraka and Ed Dorn, Kenneth Koch and Frank O'Hara, Muriel Rukeyser and Philip Whalen. These acts of recovery are not motivated by nostalgia, but are part of a fierce resistance to a false history imposed from outside and a refusal to take no for an answer. Uh, the speaker, the next speaker in our series that's coming next month, Lynn Tillman, has called Amiel a unique and important figure in contemporary world literature. We're very pleased to have him here tonight. Please welcome Amiel Akhle. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Levi, for uh, having me. Um, the subject, of, I almost feel like subject of my talk, the national security state, we could just step out into the foyer there and, you know, observe. We wouldn't really, I wouldn't really have to say much. Uh, apparently there's some important people that need protection uh, out there. So, um, anyways, what I, what I tend to, I'm very unused to this podium situation and I'm not crazy about it. What I think I'm going to do, what I tend to do at talks like this is completely over prepare and then kind of see, feel, intuit who's here and what you might actually want to hear from me. So what I'd like to do, actually I have two video clips which are kind of framing a lot of what I'm going to be talking about and I think maybe what we'll do is see those first and then ask for a migration over here so we can talk to each other a little bit more because this is like a Trump lawyer. I mean I feel like I'm, you know, <laughs> It's very strange. It's all triangular, and I'm seeing everybody in a in a in a kind of strange way. Um, what Levi said about history is very much on my mind, and uh, what I'd like to just start talking about is um, I've been working on a book now for about. It's coming on about six years, and it's going to be done by hook or by crook next week. Uh, it's called A Little History, and there's a little, uh, not a little, but a lot of irony in the title, uh, along with a kind of reference to, to Villon and Un Petit Testament. Uh, 
to diminish things a little bit, just say, and it's almost kind of like a Jewish joke. You want history? I'll give you a little history. Um, and in a sense, it's the archaeological work that I needed to do myself in order to discover what I know and then try to figure out what I can say about it. In other words, I've become more and more interested in, in tackling an un, a relatively untold history, which is how do we operate, how do we think about culture, how do we think about experience, how do we think about politics within the national security state, which is what we exist in. And to begin really talking about um, some of the very fundamental policies of the Cold War, which are still with us in so many ways, and possibly even more integrated into our daily lives than we can even imagine. Um, and to do that, there's a lot of markers along the way. There's a lot of different markers along the way. And one of the markers, I'm really going to be kind of starting in 1944, and I'm going to be setting up different timelines uh, as we go along. And the film, two film clips that I want to show you are one timeline, and then I want to interject a few others. Um, if we could roll, uh, I'll say a little bit about this. This is, um, this is a little film clip from a film by Henry Farini called Polis Is This, Charles Olson and the Persistence of Place. And it's uh, song three from the Maximus poems, which is a very, very important little poem by Charles Olson. Charles Olson, uh, some of you may or may not be familiar with him, he was born in 1910 in Worcester, Massachusetts, from a working class Irish and Scandinavian Swedish family. He uh, was a very bright kid. He won a debating championship and got a, a, a trip to Europe in high school. He got a scholarship to Wesleyan University. And he ended up in the um, History and American Civilization program at Harvard in the 1930s, studying under F.O. Mathiason, who uh, jumped out of a window in the 50s. Um, he was a closeted queer. And he was also under, under threat of McCarthy-type things. Um, and it's very important to get some of the institutional distinctions. Uh, the American History and Civilization program at Harvard was very different from the program that developed at Yale in, uh, after the Second World War, which was really a Cold War model for American studies uh, to interject a variety of images and representations uh, onto American history and onto the world. And that was, I, that, was, that was run by Norman Holmes Pearson, who was a champion of, of HD, uh, the great poet HD, which is an interesting fact. Uh, one of the reasons why Norman Holmes Pearson was so, uh, was recruited so heavily into the OSS and later various kind of, various shady, things was he was a great close reader. He was a great new critic. Um, so close reading was very important in, in, in psychological warfare and uh, other kinds of things of that nature. Anyways, the clip that I'm going to show you from Charles Olson. Uh, Charles Olson in, went to work then for the Roosevelt administration in the Office of War Information, along with many other intellectuals. Ben Shan worked there, the anthropologist Ruth Benedict, uh, with whom Olson had a very important correspondence in which he actually defined uh, his version of postmodernism. Uh, and that correspondence starts in 1946 and goes on. Uh, but in letters between Charles Olson and Ruth Benedict and Olson and Creeley, he really defined, and I may read some of those quotes later, um, but what Olson was doing in the Office of War Information was he was working with the American foreign immigrant press, uh, combating Axis propaganda. And um, in 1944, he resigned along with the director of the office. He was the assistant director of Office of War Information. Now, 1944-45 is also when Ezra Pound is incarcerated in Pisa and accused of treason. And uh, it's also when my parents were refugees from 
what was then Yugoslavia and were in hiding in Italy uh, from 1941 through 1951, actually. So all of these things are actually very personal and very much part of my own history as well, which is something I want to talk about. Um, but Olson uh, understood clearly that there, was, that there were deep policy changes in effect. And those deep policy changes are very hard to get at, and they have to do with the recruitment of basically you know, ex-Nazis and other Axis uh, people into the U.S. Uh, in various forms, and there are a whole bunch of different operations: Operation Overcast, Paperclip, Apple Pie, Dwindle, uh, a whole bunch of curious acronyms for these operations. But essentially, these are people who had a huge, huge hand in foreign policy and in rigging elections in Greece, in Italy, and fomenting various kinds of things in Latin America, in in Eastern Europe, etc. Now, I found just a couple of weeks ago uh, kind of the smoking gun because I had, I had written a lot about all of this stuff in, in, in a little history, but I found here the 1944 item from the New York Times, um, two, OWA, two OWI aides resign, Poulos and Olson charge interference, but director denies it. This is May 18th, 1944. Konstantin Poulos and Charles Olson at the Office of War Information's Foreign Language Section resigned today with the assertion that George W. Healy Jr., OWI domestic director, had, quote, hamstrung, unquote, the activities of their division. Mr. Healy quickly issued a statement declaring the claim untrue. Mr. Poulos, acting chief of the section, and Mr. Olson, assistant chief, contended that what they termed interference by Mr. Healy and Dowsley Clark who is director of the OWI News Bureau, had prevented them from functioning to offset Axis propaganda aimed at creating dissension among America's 35 million citizens of foreign ancestry. Um, so Olson resigns and writes his first poem um, in this period. And he has also been working, finishing a project that he begun as a student at Harvard, which turns into the really classic uh, work, Call Me Ishmael, um, which is based on his discovery of a number of things, amongst which were Melville's edition of Shakespeare with Melville's notes in it. And by discovering that through uh, Eleanor Melville Metcalf, he was able to give a completely different reading of Melville, completely different reading of Melville. Um, and it was work, you have to understand, Melville at that point, there, it was not nearly uh, the classic that we think of him as. The only work that had been really done on Melville was by Raymond Weaver and also by Olson's teacher, F.O. Mathiason, much of which he credited to Olson, actually, in his, uh, in his work. Anyways, um, April 6th, August 6th, 1945, atomic bombs. Olson is on his way back to Washington, D.C. from a research trip in Nantucket, where he was going to find out some information about the whale ship Essex. The whale ship Essex had run astray from its course, and instead of heading towards Tahiti, which was very friendly, the crew didn't really know, know that, they went in another direction to the point where they ended up cannibalizing themselves. Um, and it's right then when Olson changes the order of Call Me Ishmael uh, after the atomic bomb and realizes that the parable of this country is if you don't know where you're going, you will end up devouring yourself. Um, and he leaves politics behind completely. He leaves behind the possibilities of an academic career. And he embarks upon really what will be a renunciation of any privileges that he might have been able to glean uh, by virtue of being educated, white, um, even though he came from a working class background. And in his 1965, uh, performance at Berkeley, 
He says, I'm that famous thing. I'm the white man. I'm the pale face. And the only, the only good thing about that is that I haven't, I haven't participated. I haven't, I haven't taken up the power that was given to me. But Olson never retreated. He just went to another place from which his politics were um, conceptualized and enacted. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but let's roll song three, which uh, has Olson reading this little poem, which has very much to do with a kind of, you know, vow of poverty. And it has some very remarkable black and white clips of his apartment in Gloucester, which uh, I spent some time in because he was a family friend. And I spent quite a bit of time in Gloucester as a kid. So there's also that very personal connection. And it's followed by a little clip by the poet Amiri Baraka talking about Olson. Uh, so if we could roll that, song three, people, thank you. <laughs> this will come on in a second. They said it'll take a, a minute to, uh, this is, again, as I said, from Henry Farini's film, um, Polis is this, Ols Charles Olson and the Persistence of Place, which was shown on PBS a couple of years ago. Song three. This morning of the small snow, I count the blessings, the leak in the faucet, which makes of the saint time the drop of the water on water as sweet as the Seth Thomas in the old kitchen. My father stood in his drawers to wind always. He forgot the 30th day, as I don't want to remember the rent. A house these days, so much somebody else's, especially Congolians. Or the plumbing, that it doesn't work. This I like, have even used paper clips as well as string to hold the ball up and flush it with my hand. But that the car doesn't, that no moving thing moves without that song I'd void my ear of, the music racket of all ownership. Holes in my shoes, that's all right, my fly gaping, me out at the elbows, the blessing that difficulties are once more in the midst of plenty walk as close to there. In the face of sweetness, in the time of goodness, go side, go smashing, beat them, go as, as near as you can, tear. In the land of plenty, have nothing to do with it. Take the way of the lowest, including your legs. Go, contrary, go, sing. He had a political aspect to the work that I liked. It was political, it was also archeological, you know, anthropological, and all of that together, for me, it made a new horizon of what you could do, that you could take every aspect of your mind and utilize it as a poet. Not the obscure and the recondite, but what actually is the matter that moves the most people. What are the concerns of the people? Why are they those concerns? And the whole question of putting the hinge back on the door, that is, trying to find out what had been hidden from us by the, you know, the, the emergence of this new one-sided society. Uh, that was important, particularly for me being black, because I knew part of that was the connection to, to Africa. What, where, do, where, where are the foundations of the world from? You know? And, and uh, Charles was saying, you have to go back, you have to go back. A couple of things. I wanted you just to get some of the visual, uh, sensual feeling. I mean, besides the black and white nostalgia and so forth. But um, you know, of a of a of a world that you know from our, from this remove could very well be on another planet. Um, I think just in terms of its conditions, textures, and so forth. Um, I want to focus on something that Amiri Baraka said about going back, going back. Olson had a project, he had several major projects. One was red, black, and white, which was about this country, um, Indians, Africans, and Europeans, uh, to translate that. Uh, some of that thought took him to, took him to the Yucatan, to do some amateur archaeology, which in fact turned out to be not that amateur at all, and is 
is uh, the, the evidence of that can be seen in the Mayan letters, which essentially were edited out from his correspondence with Robert Creeley, but it, it was a lifelong interest of his. And he discovered a lot of things there, that he intuited a lot of things, and he discovered a lot of things through his methodological research uh, that hadn't been thought of really before. And at the same time, in 1951, he uh, had applied for a Fulbright to go to Iraq to go to study the cuneiform culture in its own sites, in its own original sites, uh, Mesop Mesopotamian culture. And Olson had a very, had a, had a, was on to things that were very interesting. He always, th he thought that antiquity itself must have an antiquity. In other words, we, we posit a certain antiquity behind which there seems to be nothing. But he always felt that antiquity has its own antiquity. So if you study the Babylonians, you find out that the Babylonians had archeologists who were, who were, who were just trying to find out what was before them. And what I feel has happened, especially with, with, with from the Gulf War on, and particularly in this, in this Iraq war, um, for somebody like Olson, born in 1910, I also think of, of uh, the musician Sun Ra, who as a kid in growing up uh, was fascinated by the discoveries of, of, of Egypt and of the tomb of King Tut. And Sun Ra became a very avid uh, Egyptologist and, and really amassed an enormous library uh, over the course of his lifetime in things related to Egypt. And many of the ideas of Afrocentricity and so forth can be traced really in some sense to, to I mean, many, many different sources, but Sun Ra was a, was a huge, a huge, uh, uh, and Olson as well as a kid was following things like the discovery of Folsom Man in this, in this continent, which, which antedated uh, human habitation on the continent by, by more than 10,000 years. And so there was a sense of the past uh, growing in front of you. And I think we've come to a point where particularly, uh, I, I really feel besides, you know, the obvious geopolitical and economic and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera reasons, there is some other reason why Iraq, the so-called cradle of civilization or of Western civilization has been so relentlessly attacked and why we have U.S. policy has gone into a very different mode of uh, state destruction, uh, which is a, which is a new a new phase of foreign policy of state destruction, uh, really the dismantling of the state, um, and that's something very new that we might talk about at some point. Um, <clears throat> okay, now I want to go to another frame. Uh, Olson dies in 1970. Um, 1970, uh, in a sense, the U.S. is in the midst of the war in Vietnam, but in many ways it's already lost. Uh, the U.S. has already been defeated in many ways, and the war continues till 1975. Um, in the meantime, uh, protest movements, around, well, actually, let, let's show this and then I'll do some of the history. I'd like to see this. I, I doubt that uh, many people here have seen this clip, uh, which is kind of astonishing because it's probably, for me at least, one of the most powerful images of, of the century that I can think of. Um, so let's roll that uh, second clip, uh, which may take a second to queue up because it's all the way at the end of the DVD. Um, this is from an event called Dewey Canyon 3. This is an honorable discharge. It says, from the Armed Forces of the United States of America, this is to certify that Alan Wallace Morentz, Airman Second Class Regular Air Force, was honorably discharged from the United States Air Force on the 23rd day of May, December 66. Down at the bottom it says, this is an important record, safeguarded. <laughs> Skip Walsh, Sarasota, Florida, an Army Commendation Medal, and all my stuff. Terry DeMont, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, Purple Heart, and CIB. Ron Pagansky, Fort Fox, New York, a lot of shit. Walt Kurtz, Tennessee, four Brian Stars. Right on. Yellow 
I pray that time will forgive me and my brothers what we did. And only those lumping pigs behind those closed doors will have to suffer, and not the young kids and the unborn kids. My name is Cruz Sanabria from New York, and I have a Vietnamese campaign ribbon, Vietnamese service ribbon, national defense ribbon, and a Purple Heart. Andrew Papachak from New York. I have the Vietnamese right Ribbons and a Bronze Star. My name is John Morrow, and here's a bunch of bullshit. More bullshit! <laughs> My name is Peter Brannigan, and I got a purple heart here, and I hope I get another one fighting these motherfuckers. <laughs> Robert Jones, New York, I symbolically return all Vietnam medals and other service medals given me, given me by the power structure that has genocidal policies against non-white peoples of the world. Right on. Right on. All power to the people. This is for the brothers and sisters of Kent. For the brothers and sisters this year. People. 22nd Cowsley's flight in Da Nang, and I hope they realize this is their last goddamn chance. Yeah. 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 Fall up spec four army, retired. I'm taking in nine Purple Hearts, Distinguished Service Cross, Silver Star, Bronze Star, Army Commendation, and a lot of other shit. This is for my brothers. Out of curiosity, how, how, how many people have ever seen that clip before? Have ever seen it? Have seen it? Have seen it? Nobody? You've seen it? Yeah. Okay. Few, few people. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty, pretty astonishing piece of footage. Um, the reason why I wanted to show, uh, I mean, my, my thinking behind this was uh, two things. One, take the case of Olson, who removes himself from positions of power at a very crucial time and actually has an enormous influence across the culture, one that is pretty unacknowledged, but, but evidence of it is everywhere. And I won't go into it heavily, but it's there. Um, and another instance of a collective action um, that came after, uh, after years of, of, of resistance within the army uh, by GIs and is publicly demonstrated, you know, at the very seat of power in front of the White House. Um, and I guess those two, you know, those two, uh, parameters are very important for me in terms of thinking about, you know, where we are now and what our distance is from those kind of events and the effects of those kinds of events. Um, so anyways, I'll leave that at that and, and do a little history um, that I think, uh, starting from the present, um, there's multiple concerns here. There's a lot of stuff that I would like to say. It would take, you know, like a year-long series of talks or, or get-togethers to even get start scratching the surface. But I'm going to I'm going to see where I can go with it. Um, the concerns begin with the sense that post Second World War, in the restructuring of American society, which has antecedents and beginnings from the First World War with the Wilson administration and all kinds of policies that were put into place, uh, fundamentally beginning, I think, with the change from being a protectionist society, protectionist economy, um, to a non-protectionist economy in which, 
you know, fend for yourself. Um, and, and, you know, we're at the far stages of that with, with, with so-called free trade. Um, but I think that affects everything. I think that there's outsourcing of intellect, there's outsourcing of aesthetics, there's outsourcing of emotions, there's outsourcing of all kinds of things. It isn't simply goods, materials. I think this has a pervasive effect across the society. And I, I'm a big proponent when I teach of having people read uh, official reports. Um, any the Kerner Commission, the Warren Commission, the 9-11 Commission, whatever. Very helpful to understand how, um, how policymakers are, are, what vocabularies they're using, what narratives they're using, and how they're framing uh, reality. And uh, in the 9-11 Commission report, there is a fascinating chapter, section 11.1, .1, which is called Imagination. Uh, is anybody encounter that or remember that or familiar with that bit? Yeah. Um, it, uh, I'll, I'll read from the, the, right before that, there's a section which sounds like it was written by literary theorists. Um, in composing this narrative, we have tried to remember that we write with the benefit of hindsight. Hindsight can sometimes see the past clearly with 2020 vision. But the path of what happened is so brightly lit that it places everything else more deeply into shadow. Commenting on Pearl Harbor, Roberta Wolstetter found it, quote, much, unquote, easier after the event to sort the relevant from the irrelevant signals. After the event, of course, a signal is always clear. We can see what disaster it was signaling since the disaster has occurred. But before the event, it is obscure and pregnant with conflicting meanings. As time passes, more documents become available, and the bare facts of what happened become still clearer. Yet the picture of how those things happened becomes harder to reimagine as that past world with its preoccupations and uncertainty recedes and the remaining memories of it become colored by what happened and what was written about it later. With that caution in mind, we asked ourselves before we judged others whether the insights that seem apparent now would have been meaningful at the time, given the limits of what people then could reasonably have known or done. Now this is a kind of colonization of the past, which, which, uh, which is such a deep impulse in the culture um, and comes through in all kinds of ways. I mean, one can see it essentially in, I was thinking a lot recently about um, one of the odd things, like if you pick up, uh, often if people pick up like a human rights report on a, on a country, they'll, be, they'll say, oh, country X, conditions are horrible. Instead of saying, hmm, country X, tremendous amount of resistance, Look how much repression is needed to control it. Um, and I think it's a very effective way to think about when we bemoan the commodification of things in this relentlessly consumer culture to rethink that a little bit. And I've been thinking a lot about um, the commodification of beat culture, for instance, uh, which has been relentlessly commodified. And I keep wondering, well, why is that? Why is that? And I started thinking, well, you know, the beat books in most bookstores are always behind the register because people steal them, you know, and most of the people who steal them are not enrolled in schools. Um, and there's a tremendous power to that, to that movement. And I think one of the, you know, intents in its commodification, besides that it's always easier to make money off dead people, is that um, it maintains a, a, a very deep subversive power. Um, and, and, and it needs to be contained because really the culture of the Cold War is about containment. And containment can take place in, in very blatant ways or in very innocuous ways, you know, where it's really written into the script of ourselves um, and, and not, you know, not, not, there's no, no, no brutality involved. It's the brutality we, we you know, we, we perform on ourselves. Anyways, this goes on. Um, uh, <coughs> Uh, I write, what is really at stake here are war mechanisms, primitive triggers to reorder the past to make it conform to the, quote, logical necessity of the present. Um, uh, colonization takes place across the board. There can be no liberty or liberation, no outside in the poet Jack Spicer's sense. Uh, nothing beyond an all-encompassing present that does not merely contain the past but dictates its meaning and limit. Now here's the kicker. The report's conclusion states, we believe the 9-11 attacks revealed four kinds of failures in imagination, policy, capabilities, and management. 
In section 11.1, titled Imagination, it says, considering what was not done suggests possible ways to institutionalize imagination. It is therefore crucial to find a way of routinizing, even bureaucratizing the exercise of imagination. Um, now, I would, when I first read this, I, you know, I thought about it quite a bit, and then I, I realized actually this is not projective, it's actually descriptive. It's descriptive of, of a place we're already in. We're already very much in. And um, I think the, the, the events around Abu Ghraib were very much uh, uh, proved that in some sense because the kind of uh, the shock displayed at, at, you know, at what was going on in, uh, at Abu Ghraib immediately said what it wasn't saying which was something about our own prison population, which from the time of that clip, Dewey Canyon 3, 1971, has grown from about 300,000 to two and a half million, and actually way more people who are in the system, parole, et cetera. It's something like seven, seven point something million, one in 31 American adults is revolving around the prison system in one form or another, highest in the world. So, how do we, you know, what is the, first of all, the question that one would ask is, well, what kinds of resistance does that imprisonment, is that imprisonment call, calling forth, you know, or, 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 or what, what, what does it propose to deal with? Or is it simply across the board a way of suppressing everything potentially? Um, so these are things I think that are, you know, very much worth thinking about. And um, it, the, 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 the clip that I showed you of the, of the veterans, in a way, was um, uh, Olson wrote a, well, a little review in the 50s of, a, of, a, of a, a little book on Billy the Kid. And one of the things in that little review he said was, he said, what strikes me about the history of said states is that it stays unrelieved as people are trying to turn it into history or into story or into anything, it stays unrelieved. And um, one of the things I think that, that's very palpable in seeing that, that, that clip of those veterans is that resistance and that burden, the pain that those people went through to take nine Purple Hearts and throw them away, um, to have to actually do that to make themselves do that and to, in a sense, cleanse themselves of the murderers that they were turned into in the name of somebody else uh, is a collective burden, a responsibility that they have taken for us, you know, who didn't do it. Um, and what happens to that when it disappears? What happens to that? It doesn't disappear. You know, it's like the Langston Hughes poem. It festers. It festers somewhere. Um, and so I think, you know, there's one little quote here and then I want to do a little bit of chronology and hopefully kind of put this into some, some perspective. Um, this is from, uh, this is again going back to uh, uh, the prison business and it's from a book called uh, Prisons Inside the New America by uh, the poet and novelist David Matlin who taught for many years in the New York State prison system. Um, and um, He's writing about Abu Ghraib and he says, that this is a triumph generating barrenness and dread at the secret core of our daily lives, so tangled we don't any longer know how exactly its touch rots every one of us. The pictures from Abu Ghraib swelled with perversion and self-satisfied hate are only hints of our domestic abyss we have already perfected and begun to export. This is not a threshold looming before us as a people. It is a threshold we passed through long ago, and we have been for at least two generations perfecting its ransoms. So the idea that we're ransomed to policy um, is something that I would, you know, I would say the poets that I'm, that I'm talking about and are interested in are very, very clear about, extremely clear about, crystal clear, lucidly clear, um, and one of the ways that one can see this is that a lot of these people who, 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 who really became public uh, in the 50s, 
sought out relationships to people who had lived through the 30s. And so there are a whole bunch of key figures from the 30s who are very important, who, who had active, act in, the, in, in a period in which aesthetics and politics was not, you know, had not been cleft down the middle, as it had been really publicly through the trial of Ezra Pound. I mean, one of the purposes, I think, of the trial of Ezra Pound, who is, I think, the only prominent American who was tried for treason at, you know, within weeks' time at which people like Gustav Hilger, an SS person, uh, is being farmed out, you know, to a think tank and, and uh, dozens, dozens, hundreds of other clear, you know, war criminals are, are being uh, employed by the government and, and by the academic structures, which were always a cover. Uh, I, and I always caution people to rethink, you know, your championing of academic freedom because academic freedom really was a policy put in place uh, by the CIA in order to, to enable them to do what they wanted at these various university-based centers. Um, it was a very good cover for that. Um, so I lost the thread of my thought. Trying to juggle a lot of balls. What was I saying? Trial of Ezra Pound. Thank you. Dave. Um, okay, the issue in the Pound trial was, you know, he's a fascist, but he's a great poet. Um, so can you can you how do you equate those things? Do you give him a? This is around the the the, the question of the Bollingen Prize, uh, which he was which he was nominated for. Um, the question is, can you give such a person this prize? Um, and so you have a, a debate that is really a non-debate. Um, and uh, Charles Olson had been visiting uh, Pound while he was incarcerated at St. Elizabeth's and uh, corresponding with him and at some point, you know, renounced him, got very angry with him for a variety of things. But he was really one of the few people who who pinpointed the real issues was, and in many ways it's very similar to some of the questions that Hannah Arendt asks in Eichmann in Jerusalem, is, you know, where is the authority to try this person? Um, if you have the authority to try this person, then go ahead and try them, you know, and, and try them for, you know, in, 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 real, in, real, in real terms of justice. Um, and Olson felt that, they, they, that he didn't condone uh, anything regarding Pound, but he felt that uh, actually Pound was putting the government on trial and, and, that, and that the insanity uh, thing was really a cop-out, that they would never would put him on trial because the issues that would come up would be too, too problematic. Um, so anyways, to get back to this, a lot of these, a, a lot of these prominent uh, people from, from the 50s seek out people who had had experience in the 30s. So somebody like Muriel Rukeyser, for instance, is an important figure. She had been uh, US one, her, 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 her poem on the Gauley Bridge mining disaster, her involvement in the Spanish Civil War as a, as a journalist, um, generally her, her um, uh, somebody like Langston Hughes, obviously. Uh, Charles Olson goes to visit in Gloucester Vincent Farini. Vincent Farini is somebody who was very active in the labor movement in very tough conditions in, around New England in uh, the General Electric strike and, and other things. Uh, Kenneth Rexroth is a very important figure. He's somebody who had kind of gotten to the tail end of the Wobblies and worked his way through the beats and the counterculture. Um, and, and many, many other figures like this who, were very, who, 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 who provided some kind of, some kind of sense because um, if one looks at the literature of, of you know, so-called modernist literature or, or the literature of the, of the 30s particularly, um, there's no real contradiction between aesthetic innovation and overt political messaging um, and it's not not considered at all contradictory and it's really part of how people thought about their their work and this is something that becomes very different in the Cold War period and it's something that we still live with today where we have these absurd arguments about pol political or non-political poetry rather than seeing a poem as an object in the world that is you know affected by politics, that, is, that, that exists in a political world, that exists in states, that exists in languages, 
uh, which have which have you know which have hierarchies and have 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 uh, all kinds of you know. Um, so let me see. What, what's our time time frame doing to us? I just yeah yeah no. I'm just trying to figure out where where to where to go. Well, let me let me do a couple of just very very straight. Cold War things and, and a couple of historical things that I hope will, and then maybe go more to what I'm talking about here in these the the, the poets and and kind of the title of my talk, um, a key a key uh, policy statement for the Cold War is uh, George Keenan's uh, then secret uh, policy study 23, in which <clears throat> one of the things he says is. Uh, we have about 50% of the world's wealth, but only 6.3% of its population. This disparity is particularly great as between ourselves and the peoples of Asia. In this situation, we cannot fail to be the object of envy and resentment. Our real task in the coming period is to devise a pattern of relationships which will permit us to maintain this position of disparity without positive detriment to our national security. Um, there you have it, pretty much. Um, you know, need for resources, uh, living above one's means, and plundering the rest of the world in order to make that happen. Pretty simple. Um, now, one of the one of the one of the ways in which people are made to um, sever themselves from their common sense and from their experience is through psychological warfare, which essentially becomes the 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 operating procedure for com what we now call communication studies. Uh, the whole field of communications as it develops in the Cold War is really um, covert psychological warfare uh, and sometimes overt. And um, one of the things that, that kind of hobby horses that I have is I feel that at a certain point um, in, in the US, particularly in academic structures and intellectual debates or non-debates, um, the, the embrace of, of continental theory really came both, number one, decontextualized from its, from its origins, which has a lot to do with decolonization and not post-coloniality. Um, and I'll go into that a little bit more. Um, but it really took the place of the thought of poets the thought of poets, because the thought of poets in the US in the 50s and 60s and 70s took the place of many other fields. Many of these poets that, that, that I'm thinking about and writing about um, did historical studies, did research of various kinds, worked in a variety of fields, uncovered various aspects of history. Um, Miro Rukeyser's Willard Gibbs masterpiece of, of uh, an absolute masterpiece of historical research, uh, Charles Olson's Call Me Ishmael, Amiri Baraka's Blues People, Ed Dorn's The Shoshoneans. Uh, one could go on and on and on and, and see uh, that there are texts that would not fit in any particular academic niche or discipline or vocabulary or terminology, but uh, needed to be created outside of that framework because essentially that framework would not allow those works to, 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 to take place. Um, so psychological warfare and uh, the national security state. I want a little quote here from a great book which is out of print, Science of Coercion, Communication Research and Psychological Warfare, 1945 to 1960 by Christopher Simpson. Christopher Simpson is also the only book that methodically goes through all the uh, CIA operations regarding Nazis, war criminals, et cetera, in a book called Blowback, um, which may be in print. Um, anyways, here is um, a quote from Simpson's book. At heart, modern psychological warfare has been a tool for managing empire, not for settling conflicts in any fundamental sense. It has operated largely as a means to ensure that indigenous democratic initiatives in the third world in Europe did not go, quote, too far, unquote, from the standpoint of US security agencies. Its primary utility has been its ability to suppress or distort unauthorized communication among subject peoples 
including domestic U.S. dissenters who challenge the wisdom or morality of imperial policies. Unauthorized communication, okay? Um, communication then becomes this huge, huge thing. And if one looks at, um, if one looks at the early, you know, immediate post-Cold War period, I mean, here's, for instance, a quote from Allen Ginsberg in which he describes, um, let me just find this, give me a sec. Oh, too much stuff here. Um, a quote from Allen Ginsberg in which he describes the, uh, just a sec. Yeah, here, he says, uh, um, he says, actually the first perceptions that we were separate from the official version of history and reality began around 45, 46, 47. We realized that there was a difference between the way we talked, Jack, Kerouac, Burroughs, myself, as comrades among ourselves to get information in order to share experience and find our ultimate heart or vision. And what we heard on the radio, if any president or congressman or even literary person began talking officialese, consciousness wasn't present there on the occasion when they were talking. Consciousness was an abstract theoretical state, a theoretical nation. The actual nation was not there, which was basically the same thing that Ezra Pound and William Carlos Williams and Sherwood Anderson had been saying all along. Um, so again, he's referring back to older figures and talking about a, a, the creation of a set of, of horizons, possibilities that are unreal, that have no relationship to, to uh, life as somebody is actually living it. Um, and communication then becomes very important because you have essentially in this world of, of, of poets, writers, thinkers, um, a, 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 a kind of, um, first of all, communication by letter writing, by correspondence. Uh, I mean, if you look, for instance, at the earlier correspondence of the poet Robert Duncan and Denise Levertov, a lot of it is just about typescripts that they're sending back and forth to each other because their work isn't being published and they're sending typescripts back and forth to each other. Um, people are, Gary Snyder famously said, you know, in those days you would travel, you know, you would hitchhike a thousand miles to, to see a friend. Um, so a sense of, of extreme isolation, but also a sense that there were other people who were starting to think this way, who were starting to, to to uh, find different, you know, different, different realities. And, and so you begin to have congregations of people, congregations of people, and sometimes these congregations end up in, in uh, for instance, a, a situation like, like um, Black Mountain College, for instance, or a situation like, uh, San Francisco and, and, and the famous six gallery reading, for instance. Now, one of the interesting things about the six gallery reading, 1955, 1954, you have Dien Bien Phu uh, and the defeat of the French, um, in which General Jap says, you know, this is really the first time when, when, when you can see that a, you know, a technologically backward country can defeat you know, with the will, can defeat a great power. Um, and immediately after the, the defeat at, at Dien Bien Phu, um, you begin to have a uh, re revolt in Algeria, uh, which lasts until 1962, when, when Algeria, um, and, and a very important factor in this, again, which relates to these soldiers, and, and the huge difference besides, you know, two, the huge structural difference that we have in, the, in our society now, post-American uh, war in Vietnam, is no draft. So we have a privatized, you know, or, or paid army, and the effects are, are much more hidden 
They're not, you know, they're, they're much more hidden. It's not, it doesn't go across the board. People, you, you know, unless you know people who, who uh, it's not, a, it's not affect, it's not, a, it doesn't affect the whole society. It affects certain people. It affects certain classes of people. Um, so it's a very different kind of situation than you had then. Um, but one of the huge factors in decolonization, which is not studied, as opposed to post-coloniality, which is studied, um, is that the, the conscription of colonized subjects from the First World War and into the Second World War really uh, begins a, a process that is unstoppable, because if, if North Africans and Africans are armed and killing Germans and they come back to their homes and their colonized subjects, that's not going to last too long. And that happens in, in 1945, for instance, in the, in the um, uprisings in Satif in Algeria, where 103 Europeans are killed and the reprisals in air power, bombing, napalming, uh, nobody really knows the figures, but somewhere between five and 15,000 people are killed. Um, and that really, you know, indelibly sows the seed for what will become the Algerian Revolution. Um, so to go back to something like the Gallery 6 reading, which, you know, it's a poetry reading. Okay, one of the organizers of the 6th Gallery reading was Wally Hedrick, a uh, very important, innovative artist who was then married to Jay DeFeo, who painted the Great Rose, uh, which she painted from 1958 to about 1964, and it may have killed her uh, from the pigment that she was using. Um, and Wally Hedrick had been uh, an infantryman in Korea and had come back from Korea and had immediately started a series of paintings which were anti-Vietnam War paintings. Uh, because he understood that the French were, were, had, had withdrawn, but the Americans were covertly already getting involved. Now, this idea of the body, which has become, you know, so fashionable, again, was a very central idea, a uh, very central idea in Olson, uh, who also was a dancer. Um, but he wrote a text in 1946 called The, the Resistance, um, in which he basically said, you know, after what we have witnessed in the world, and this came about through personal relationship he had to two people, Jacques Roubaud, who was a French mathematician and had been uh, in a concentration camp, and in, in Olson's great poem, La Préface, which is really the first American poem that I'm aware of that references the death camps, uh, 1946, um, uh, he mentions, you know, a, a person weighs 80 pounds, and that was his friend Jacques Roubaud. Uh, and another person, Corrado Cagli, who was an Italian uh, sculptor um, who I have some family relationship with, and that's actually how my parents got to know Olson. Um, Cagli had, had left, uh, had sent his daughter to the U.S. when the anti-Jewish laws went into effect in the Mussolini regime, and then he came to the U.S. himself and, and uh, enlisted in the U.S. Army as, uh, as an interpreter, I believe, and he was one of the liberators of Buchenwald, and he did a series of remarkable drawings. Um, and he met Olson in Washington uh, in this period, and, and they were very taken with each other. It was a very important relationship, but um, it was very, you know, it was very clear to Olson that, that any ideas of humanism or, or, or of civilization were basically worthless uh, given 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 the conditions and this was this was something that one would see for instance echoed in the writings of M. A. Cesar for instance in Discourse on Colonialism where where Cesar talks about um, you know Nazism simply being a, a further extension of of colonial practices of, of decimation of peoples and um, and actually, this is something that ultimately I think Hannah Arendt would also agree with, because that she makes that distinction as well, that there is a continuity between colonialism and fascism and, and what takes place in, in Europe. Um, so part of what I've been trying to do besides, you know, it's not, a, not simply a question of recovery, recuperation, but of, of, of actually understanding uh, at, at this point in time for ourselves, you know, what legacy are we in? And what do we have to draw on? I mean, there, there is enormous power to be drawn from these, from these writers and from their work. Enormous power, enormous courage, enormous 
I really think heroism in many cases, messy lives, very messy lives, you know, all kinds of casualties along the way, family members and, and all kinds of others. Um, uh, difficult figures, many of them, but, but um, operating it with incredible imagination, ingenuity. I mean, when, that, when I read that 9-11 um, quote, it reminds me, of course, of uh, um, famous lines by poet Diane de Prima, uh, the only war that matters is the war against the imagination. All other wars are subsumed in it. Um, now, that was written 20 or so years prior to this, uh, to this thing, but, you know, policymakers are, 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 you know, are thinking people. They're not dumb. <laughs> they, that was a they, you know, very astute, very astute uh, kind of conclusion to that 9-11 report um, to, to talk about imagination and to put a, a limited horizon on the possibility of imagination. Um, because if you can't imagine something, you can't even know what it is you would, you would want or strive for it or, or find it. Um, and so I think the, you know, the imaginative politics of some of these writers, I mean, when one encounters Robert Duncan, the astuteness and clarity of his political uh, thinking is astonishing and has so much to teach us. Um, one can find, for instance, in, you know, in mild-mannered Buddhist uh, Philip Whalen, you know some of the most, uh, you know some of the most astonishingly clear political, class-based uh, responses to the world. Uh, there's a, there's a there's lines from a poem that he actually wrote to Diane de Prima, which I think if they were in you know if if we had encountered them post 9/11, he would have gotten locked up. Um, it was written. Uh, let's see if I can find this. Um, yeah, this is probably going to be tough to find. Well, if I find it, I'll find it. Um, anyways, I'm wondering maybe if it's time to hear some thoughts from you. You know, when you talked about this marker that Ginsburg put down, 45, 46, 47, where the idea of separate... You're, is that... Uh, okay. The... Um, the marker that Ginsburg put down, 45, 46, 47, and this, this, the separation where there was a, it was a possibility to separate uh, and think another way. Mm -hmm. I'm, trying, I'm wondering what you think about when the other end of that bracket is, when that kind of separation literally becomes unthinkable. I, I'm I, guessing like nine, 1992 about. Well, uh, I'm, I, I think um, there's, a, there's um, if you remember the point in Ed Dorn's Gunslinger where the character I disappears, um, that would be around 1975, I think. Uh, Ed Dorn has a, a quote, which now this one I really need to find. The other one was a little bit, you know, here it is. Um, in The Death of I, in book two of Gunslinger, and if, if, you've, if, if you've never read Gunslinger, I suggest you get it, you know, ASAP and read it. Um, because, I mean, at least for me, in the years that it was coming out, it was like, I would imagine people waiting, you know, for, for a serialized Dickens or something by the ship, by the docks, you know, you were wait it was the news. I mean, the Gunslinger was the news. Um, anyways, uh, Ed Dorn says, uh, when queried in an interview about the death of I in book two of Gunslinger, Ed Dorn refers to a line in which I becomes the container of the thing it contains. Far from some metaphysical meditation, Dorn goes on to explain this as a reference to, quote, using our returning dead as containers. Back then, the CIA was sewing kilos of heroin inside the thorax of the cadavers of our returning dead from Vietnam, sewing it back up and shipping the body back to Long Beach, San Francisco, and Chicago. These were the first containers of heroin. This was Air America. This was the first big off-the-books money. Um, so I've thought about that question a lot, and I think that, I don't know if there's a moment. I think there are probably many moments. I think certainly the, 
the formal end of the Cold War and you know the beginning of the Gulf War. Uh, I mean, you do have you do have a period from 1975 to 1990 of covert warfare, um, and the first you know kind of massive ground troop thing in the Gulf War does definitely signal a huge change, a huge change. And it was Bush the first who said, uh, who was the only president except for Ronald Reagan to ever refer to Vietnam in a, in a, in a um, uh, State of the Union in an inaugural address. He said, uh, a nation cannot long afford to be sundered by a memory in reference to Vietnam. So clearly, I mean, the, 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 that was a policy agenda, you know, to get over that so that we can return to normal warfare or, you know, how it has now been normalized, combination of high tech and, and ground troops. So I think there's, you know, I think that I think that maybe on the poetic level, in terms of the death of I in Gunslinger is a very significant moment. But on the, you know, uh, on that level, uh, you know, of geopolitical level, I think that that's also a very and significant. In the, I moment. mean, in this thing about the the war against the imagination, when it became a total war, the Gulf War. The images change. The use of images changed Absolutely, completely. Yeah. yeah. And uh, past that point, it became all harder and harder, and then ultimately impossible to think of a separate to get to gain enough yeah. ground to be able to separate. Yeah. Um, yeah. You really do go into full surround mode where everything is part of the deal. And I mean, I think, you know, also, frankly, I mean, this has got to be related to, I mean, we're all using the internet, but the internet is a military installation. And I mean, we're participating in it, but that, you know, that's where it began. And it has to have some effect, you know, on, on our use in it and of it. Um, so it, it's kind of total implication, I guess, you know, in, in that sense. And then, you know, the question becomes, you know, where do you find your power? Where do you act? How do you, um, I mean, I found it very instructive, for instance, I, I've done a lot of, uh, stuff related to the Middle East and, um, I was the, the subject of a, of a, of a, of an attack in 2005 by this, uh, neocon, uh, Campus Watch group, and the most there was an article. There were several series of articles, but there was one called uh, "Poetry, Terror, and Political Narcissism." And um, what was most interesting about it was that actually it was the best validation of my work that anybody had written. I mean, it was somewhat libelous, uh, you know, in a number of instances, but it was actually, you know, these are people who are actually paid to pay attention to what I was doing and I was having an effect. And most interestingly, it came at a point when I was less, much less involved in institutionally in things outside the US, and I was very involved in US, particularly literary institutions. Now here's an instance where the so-called progressives are all like, you know, we're powerless and blah, 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 and this and that. And meanwhile, the right wing are very clear that literary culture is of utmost importance, rep representation is of utmost importance, narrative is of utmost importance, um, and they're very aware of this and very clear about it. And when you are effective in that sphere, they respond. And it was actually, it was a very, you know, heartening kind of thing to, to see this attack, you know, it was really... <laughs> um, Garth, did you... It stays unrelieved. Yeah. Um, you use the word uh, "we are ransomed," and I just, that was fascinating. I didn't catch the whole context. The the quote was um, the quote with the ransom business was uh, was from David Matlin about the about prisons, and he was saying that you know you begin to export this policy. I mean, Abu Ghraib for Abu Ghraib was built by a, by a contractor from Long Island. Um, in Saddam's Iraq, and it was championed at that time by the U.S. as this great, you know, technological wonder, great prison, et cetera. You know, it was kind of along the model of our prisons. And, um, you know, I think what Madeline was saying in that is w when there's a disconnect between what we're practicing as a matter of course domestically and not aware of 
and the exportation of it, it's a certain kind of ransom that, that, that you're, you're, you're being kidnapped, actually. You're being kidnapped. Your, 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 your participation in a, you know, um, as, as, a, as a citizen is, is a, there's a, you know, you're, you're, it's like blood money. Is that, does that make it clear? Not yet. All right. Well, we'll keep working on that. I, it's it's a very it's a, it, Madeline's language actually is very uh, Elizabethan. I would say. I mean, it, you know, in a beautiful way. And I think he's really striving towards getting us to think at some higher level about about these things that happen in a pedestrian way. And he's using you know using um, that kind of concept that you might see you know in a in a in a love poem you know of, of being ransomed or of being you know there's a there's a very you know curious use of language there so i think it's not a simple there's not a simple explanation to his way of using that i think back there yeah i'm still looking for this philip whalen quote um hi i have uh, actually three questions can okay. i ask all three We'll I'll ask, start, I'll ask, okay. start with the first, and let's okay. see where we get. Um, you talked about the increase in the prison system. Yeah. From 300,000 to over 2 million. Yeah. How did we get here, there? Well. How, what, what led to that? Yeah. I mean. That's one. Yeah. OK. Well, I would say w what led to that was the criminalization of certain sectors of the population um, in which they're a priori criminalized and so all you then need to do is put them in prison um, because they've already been targeted as being potentially criminal and and I think that really you know um, I mean I have a I have a, a piece in, in 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 a book of mine called scrap metal which which um, you know asks the question assess the implications of the following. One, the United States lost the war in Vietnam. Two, the United States was defeated in the war in Vietnam. Three, neither of the above is true. Four, where else was the quote, war in Vietnam, unquote, fought? And I think, I mean, if you look at the economics of it and, and the changes that take place, moving off the gold standard, 1971, the beginning of deindustrialization and outsourcing the you know the, the whole basically that the US is colonized by its own government in many senses and 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 um, and it becomes restructured in an in an almost IMF way I mean uh, all I mean having I was a I was going to city college in in the mid 70s um, City College was the city university was the last free university system left in the country, and it was really a a very big deal to break the back of City University in the in the in in the Ford administration, 1976, um, and to change the nature of people's expectations from, you know education to very limited possibilities. And one of those limited possibilities was cr criminalization. So I think that there are a whole bunch of economic political decisions that were made that, you know, and, and I think that there's a certain, um, it's, a, it's a mechanism of control and fear that you, you know, you, you create these, these absolute divisions amongst people, amongst classes, amongst colors, and it, 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 it puts people on guard. It makes people afraid to communicate, to communicate with each other. Okay, um, next question is, um, you talked about, I, I'm a product of the 60s and uh -huh. the anti-war movement uh -huh. and the things we saw on TV, right? Um, you said something that made me think of this. What, you said enormous, resources were made, used to make us forget, yeah. basically. Yeah. Can you expand on that? Sure, sure. I mean, look, look at the, look at, um, look at, ho look at Hollywood, look at the, f look at the films, look at the films that come out. Um, I mean, there, there's, 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 a, there's a number of other things that happen. I mean, there's, there's, uh, it, 
we could go back a ways to, to, to think about this. If you think about a movement like the Black Panther Party, for instance, um, the Black Panther Party began really as a, as a local self-protection group. To people in neighborhoods wanted to protect themselves. And this spread to um, a variety of services that the Black Panther Party you know, that weren't being provided in these neighborhoods that the Black Panther Party could provide. Literacy programs, free breakfast programs. I mean, the breakfast, free breakfast in the public schools is a co-optation of a Black Panther Party uh, initiative. Um, now, what happens at a time when repression gets, you know, when COINTELPRO and the repression of, of various political movements takes place is there's a focus, international focus. People, um, become associated with other countries, other governments. People go into exile. They go into hiding in places like Algeria, Cuba, et cetera. They, now, for the people, the individuals involved themselves, this was self-preservation. But what it did was it allowed a certain wedge to be created between you know, uh, indigenous local practices and something that could be demonized very easily, demonized as, as foreign, as not, you know, not, not us. And I think the roots of some of those things are there. And then you begin to see the wholesale manufacture of production of imagery uh, in films um, through the 70s that completely transform, transform the, narr the actual narratives of the war. Uh, these become, and things, you know, as people, people themselves, I mean, there's a wonderful quote in, in, in the film from the extras of David Zeiger's uh, Sir No Sir, which everybody should see. Uh, Joe Urgo, who was an early member of Vietnam Vets Against the War, is talking about an incident where he's, he, here's a couple of guys talking, and, uh, and, and he interrupts them. They're talking about the war and, and this and that, and, and he says that, don't you guys remember? Don't you remember the anti-war movement? Don't you remember the vets? Who, don't you remember people in the field who, and the one guy says, oh yeah, you know, I, my whole company actually went in, you know, stopped fighting, and, they, and they, they start to remember. And one of the guys says, you know, they really make us forget a lot of things. And then Joe Urgo says something very profound. He says there's a content to forgetting. There's a content to forgetting. Um, and I think that's, that's a very important thing for us to think about and, you know, to further kind of think about your question is w what is the content of that forgetting? What, what, what is replaced? I mean, a lot of these thoughts came to me during the Gulf War when students were asking me, like, you know, what do we do? How do we respond to this? And I was just thinking about simple things like clothing. You know, again, I was in high school, 69 to 73, and if you, you know, if you wore an army jacket then, it meant you were anti-war. It meant you were identifying with the veterans who were, who were against the war. Simple things, simple, simple kind of, you know, phenomenological, sociological tidbit. Um, and I remember, you know, I remember going to demonstrations in New York, both for this Iraq war and for the Gulf War, and I remember how different the workday was from the demonstration day, people changed their clothes. They weren't wearing buttons. They weren't wearing, you know, they, 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 were, they were going to work. Um, things like that, you know, what, what is the content of that? So it's a great question. I, you know, I don't have a full answer, but. Yeah. Uh, the other question is, um, I don't know if you can answer this, but I can ask it. What is most at stake today? Whew. Our sanity, I think. <laughs> Our sanity. Um, um, I mean, you know, in some sense, you know, the country as we know it doesn't really exist. I mean, it's we don't make anything. We're, you know, um, I, I think, you know, what happens when it, when it, when 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 a whole country becomes consumers? It's a very, you know, it's a very different a new situation. Um, I think what is at stake is kind of everything. You know, I think, I think that 
on the most basic level, people have to learn how to make things again. You know, whatever that might be. Um, but I think that's what's at stake. I think once you stop making things, you kind of become, you, you become something else. I mean, it's almost a new category of the human, of just being a consumer and not a maker. Um, and that's why I think, you know, some of the, I mean, you know, Robert Duncan and Denise Levertov had very, very profound and, and important disagreements about their responses to the war in Vietnam, both of them being obviously adamantly against it. But Duncan felt that, um, that Denise Levertov was devaluing poetry by, by, by her poetic responses to the war regardless of what she was doing as an activist. And Duncan felt that he had to give all his powers to the point where he made a vow not to publish anything from, from 1969. He said he wouldn't publish anything for 15 years. And the work that emerged in 1984, groundwork before the war, you know, in retrospect, is probably, this, probably outside, of the, outside of the writing by veterans, is probably the, the strongest single text that we have of that time and it's a very profound and 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 also ti you know also uh, classic text in the sense i mean you can put it near homer or dante or you know uh, song of roland or or you know a number of other war related um responses so i was i was uh going to do something somewhere, I can't remember, and I had a um, Egyptian cab driver, and we started talking about poetry. You know, we started talking about Mahmoud Darwish, and and um, and you know, I, I I thought a lot about that. You know, how um, you know what 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 role these things have been relegated to and how difficult it is to get out of that conundrum. I mean, you can point to people who do practice getting out of that. I mean, I think obviously of somebody like Amiri Baraka who, who, who remained in Newark to be there, to be in his place and to communicate with his community you know, besides all kinds of other registers that he employs for various other reasons. But he also does significantly remain a part of his place and a reference point for people. And that makes a huge difference. Now, there aren't too many people like that. And it's a, it, 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 it's a, it's a huge, it's a huge problem. Um, I mean, I don't really, I mean, we could talk about this for hours, but it, it is, it is a huge problem. And I think it's one that I, you know, um, Jack Hirschman, who's a great poet uh, in San Francisco, um, talks about, you know, the difference between, the, you know, what the beats have been turned into and, and the street, you know, the street poets and, and, and those, those, those poets who are, who are now, now San Francisco is, a, is, an, is, is unique in the country in that it has a public space for poetry. It's totally unique in the country. Um, and I think there's a lot of different reasons for that. I mean, there are historical reasons why San Francisco harbored certain kinds of people historically from the turn of the century on. There, there's the simple fact, the physical fact of City Lights as a, as a place that, that you can see that exists. There are, you know, named streets of writers. Uh, um, uh, there's, you know, the prominence of a poet laureate uh, who is actually very active in the library system. Jack Hirschman was one, Dvorah Major was one, Diane De Prima is now the, the, the poet laureate of San Francisco. I mean, these are the mayor meets this person, uh, they give a press conference, they appear publicly prominently. There's no other place in the country where that happens. Um, now that has an effect on kids, you know, that has an effect uh, that, that this is something that you can do, or this is something that, you know, this is a way to communicate, this is a way to, to think about things. Um, so, you know, what you're raising is central and huge. That's something I think about all the time. So.
David. Hey, man. Well, you know, they, New Jersey took, the, took it away from the Mary, who abandoned the B generation to go back to Newark, by the way. Yeah. It's interesting, but not really. Right. I wanted to ask you about Ezra Pound. You talked about him. You know, uh, th there's a little treasury of American poetry, Oscar Lewis edited, and they have a whole section in the back about the Bowling Green Prize debate and uh -huh. excerpts. Uh-huh. But I never saw Olson's name mentioned. And um, you said that um, they didn't want to have a trial, and so they had... Uh, he was declared non compus mentis, that he couldn't stand trial because he was insane. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. Alan went and saw him and talked about... And, and he, he was very cogent with Alan. He, yeah. he said something about he had the suburban attitude, pound, that he was suburban. I never understood what that meant, but maybe you could <laughs> talk more about where he was coming from and... Um, you see, there's more to that than apparently... Oh, yeah, you know. yeah. Well, look, first thing to keep in mind is... Um, uh, it was very difficult to pull the U.S. population into mobilizing for the First World War and for the Second World War. I mean, for the Second World War, most people were isolationists. I mean, the, the, it, it was very difficult for people to mobilize, to, to, to want to get into a European war. Uh, I mean, you have the famous, uh, uh, the most decorated uh, U.S. Marine ever, General Smedley Butler, who, wrote the, who gave the great speech, War is a Racket. Um, who, who, um, so that, so that the idea that, that, um, you know, and Olson himself went in, he kind of grew up more in a, you know, in what might have been more of an isolationist scene. I mean, he was a very dedicated New Dealer, but he came out of the experience feeling very betrayed. You know, he wrote a famous thing, the war is a big lie and it only, you know, it just, it, it, it affects the little people wherever they may be. And so, you know, I think Pound's, um, you know, Pound obviously had a kind of grandiosity about him, but he, I mean, he felt like if he could go and talk to Roosevelt, he'd be able to straighten him out or, um, you know, and he had all his ideas on economy and so forth. Um, which, you know, I can't get into at this point, but they're, they're you know, I, I would say, I don't know exactly how I would put it. Um, I mean, in the end, Olson had a, a, a critique of Pound's sense of history, of Pound's sense of history, that it was too tied in to um, kind of great things. Um, and that history was not about that. History was life as it's being lived by people. Um, and, and, you know, there's a, there's a great book called Encounter at St. Elizabeth's, which are Olson's notes about his visits to Pound, and they're, they're filled with just great insight, great political insight about, you know, what would it take to actually open up the issues that Pound was starting to bring up and what kind of a trial would that be? Um, so anyways, we can talk about this, but, but yeah, I'll, we'll... You did the gold lectures, right? The gold lectures, it against you? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I mean, he, yeah. he went way out on a, out on a limb for yeah. this belief. Yeah, yeah. I never could really understand what, yeah. what he thought he could affect by doing that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. What were your thoughts on um, the effect of 9-11 on the, the literary culture? And if there was any at all of, um, of um, anything beyond the stupor and the regular rhetoric, and, and if, if not, just yeah. the opposite. Yeah, well, you know, I, um, wow, I got a lot to say about that. Um, one of the things that became very clear to me in going through that was um, one of the ways in which propaganda works very well is when there's no first line of defense. And the first line of defense in any society should be peer groups, you know, and particularly people whose business it is to produce representations, poets, 
filmmakers, visual artists. Um, and having been very involved in, in uh, Bosnian stuff, there was a very small line of defense, but it was very effective. It was very effective. There was a group of people who knew each other, um, who, were, who were, you know, theater, film writers, and we were able to, um, we were able to affect a, a line of defense against propaganda and the, pro and, 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 the, and the vacuity, you know, of expertise for some time, you know. It didn't, wasn't effective, uh, you know, fully, but it, it, it certainly, you know, it certainly was present. Now, regarding 9-11 and regarding the Middle East, you know, there was like nothing, you know, nothing uh, of, 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 of real, um, affinity, you know, where something happens to somebody in Syria and, you know, it's, not, it's your friend, you know, or something happens to somebody in Palestine or in wherever and it's, it's, it's your counterpart, you know, and you're going to defend that person. So the whole structure was in such a vacuum regarding 9-11 that you had, um, you know, a real terrifying to me, willingness to to believe certain things and to not be skeptical about various things. I mean, there's a wonderful, Bertrand Russell has, uh, I think, 14 questions regarding the Warren Commission. And one of the questions is, why doesn't the Warren Commission investigate who killed President Kennedy? Because it doesn't. It's all about Oswald. It never asks the question, who killed President Kennedy? It investigates who Oswald was, what Oswald's role was. And I think, you know, the, 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 the response um, was, was to me very, very uh, deafeningly silent in so many ways. I mean, I had, for instance, been writing pretty regularly for a number of years for fairly, you know, the Village Voice, the Nation, et cetera. And I found myself just around that period, you know, not really ever being told, you know, not to do anything, but never being invited. And I began to write, um, actually, the night of 9-11, I was asked by uh, friends in Bosnia um, to, to start writing. And I said, you know, I kind of, I don't really have any place to write for here. And they, they gave me a column. Uh, I had a weekly column called Politics and Imagination in uh, a, a really terrific uh, Bosnian magazine. And that was in incredibly liberating because I noticed, and I also wrote quite a bit for Al Ahram, uh, English uh, edition in, in Cairo. Um, that was very liberating because I saw in relationship to a lot of my counterparts, contemporaries here, even people who I think w would have liked to have write certain things, they didn't have, they couldn't, there were no formal venues, there were no venues in which, I mean, just on the level of the freedom that I had of not being edited, you know, and of being able to, there's a simple instance of just one kind of imagery thing. I was writing about um, the when Bush went down to ground zero and and the all the rescue workers started to you know respond to him and USA USA and all that and I'm looking at that I looked at that thing a number of times I said what the hell does this remind me of and then I looked uh, remembered the film clips of Milosevic when he went to Gazimestan in Kosovo and it was very similar he had his handlers who were Milosevic wasn't kind of this, the whole situation I think scared him a little bit just as Bush was very unsure there and he kind of he kind of got pushed into it a little bit and when he uttered this thing, there was this symbiosis between him and the crowd that just erupted. So I wrote about that, and I just, you know, that would have been like literally impossible to write in any kind of, outside of like a pamphlet that I would have handed to somebody, but, you know, in anything that would have been printed in some kind of mass circulation. And I was, you know, I was very surprised, I wasn't surprised, I mean, it was kind of, it, it, the, 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 the horizons were very limited. The horizons of imagination were very limited of what people were willing to let themselves say and think. Um, well, you know, it worked. It, there were like there was a period where it worked. The you know immediately following 
there were like there was this there was this burst of 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 openness and curiosity. I mean, you began people, I know poets who were like plastering around their, you know, broadsides of Darwish and of Middle Eastern poetry and of, um, and, and I would see people in bookstores looking, you know, where, where, where can I find, you know, peop, there, was a, there was a genuine uh, need and hunger and awareness that something needed. And that very, very, you know, as usual became, I mean, one of the things that I've, you know, gotten a lot of you know, a lot of flack for in the last couple of years. I, I, I translate a lot, I do a lot of translation, but in the last number of years I've been talking about maybe, you know, maybe there's a need to like stop translating certain things because the context in which things get translated in this country is, is commodification. It's like, it's the same way we get, you know, cherries in the winter. It's like we need, now we need Arabic literature because there are Arabs there and we need to know about them. You know, and it isn't. It has no organic relationship to. Um, I mean, one of the things that I've done in my translation work is find both texts and venues that will challenge. You know, American writers who are. Who are who are themselves seeking, you know, new form or innovative form, and it will challenge them directly there. So they'll have to pay attention to that and be embarrassed if they don't. And that kind of is how something like the work of Samezdin Mehmedinovich worked, you know, the Sarajevo Blues, which I translated. I know it had a tremendous effect on a lot of American writers who looked at this text and they say, Jesus, what the hell was I doing, you know, from 1991 to 1995 while this was going on? Uh, it challenged them, you know, ethically and formally. And I don't think, that, I don't, I don't, I see that happening here and there, but I think that the forces are so weirdly diffuse in terms of what goes on in Arabic literature and creating some kind of a even, I mean, even take, 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 take Abu Ghraib, for instance. Abu Ghraib took place at a period when all over the Arab world there were very important uh, citizen civic um, movements regarding prisoners, regarding, regarding prisoners. This was taking place in Syria, it was taking place in, in Morocco, it was taking place as always in Palestine. Um, and Abu Ghraib was one of those great things in terms of the way U.S. policy works. You, big, big, everything big. So you don't look for anything smaller. So Abu Ghraib became like a, a, a magnet of attention all over the Arab world to concentrate on this evil and it removed some of the some of the local you know some of the local issues that were going on you know which then continued later but um, you know I, I don't know it's a, I, I, I haven't seen uh, personally that many responses that I think are are, are, uh, are deep Let's put it that way. Um, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, Amiri, you know. I mean, absolutely. I mean, and and what's so, you know, what's so amazing about that, which people hardly even noticed. I mean, first of all, just sound-wise and structurally, there's a lot. You know, it echoes howl. Okay, in so many ways. Okay, and um, what's great about that? What's great about the way Amiri does things like that is that it 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 people get outraged at this poem, and not outraged at you know at the event or at possible cover-ups at the event or that the policies that led to the event which is incredible I mean as a, as a litmus test of where you're actually at you know um, it's very similar to a poem by Mahmoud Darwish that went through called those who those who those who pass from fleeting words I can't remember how it was translated but it was a it was a poem that was debated in the Israeli parliament and it was all and and I know it, w it was a kind of a, it was a test balloon. It was a test balloon. He says, let me write this poem and see 
how people react. And I mean, what happened in Somebody Blew Up America, which was also great, which something that Amiri has done consistently, is do something that might provoke outrage in order for people to feel like, okay, I thought that, now I can say it. You know, now I can say it. It's very liberating to put yourself on the line that way and say things that other people wouldn't say, present them, represent them, put them out there and create another space in which you can take a step into. And certainly not enough of that has happened at all. But that's, yeah, that's the big example, I would think. Yeah. Yeah, uh, kind of playing off of that, um, do you think, uh, I, I kind of seen from Vietnam onward, and I think 9-11 kind of reinforced it, is that there's kind of the, been the scholastic and aesthetic uh, culture of coping where you know the academic world has kind of focused on well things have kind of gotten to this point of no return in a lot of ways especially in the political s specter yeah. and it's no longer this thought of reformation especially you know there, there's not this kind of wellspring of new ideas on how to fix it's you uh -huh. know how do we cope with the current society and that you see this a lot in the art world you see this a lot in the literary world and you know do you think that this is a necessary step to get on to, you know, or once again, a reformation, this, you know, growth of new thought? Uh, or are, are we just kind of stuck in a stupor right now? Yeah. Um, I think that's a great, you know, great way of characterizing it. Um, I don't know. You know, it, it's... I mean, it's kind of like, it seems to be kind of like the way the White House press corps operates. You know, you, you, you ask certain kind of questions because you want to be invited back, you know. And, 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 and so the question then becomes, you know, what are instances in each person's parameters where some risk is involved? And are, are they, will, you know, like with that poem, are they willing to do that publicly in a way that will allow somebody else who is latently, you know. I mean, Robert Duncan wrote um, The Homosexual in Society, which was published in 1944 in Dwight MacDonald's magazine, Politics, okay? Now, it's one of the most, it, it's an astonishing text. It's absolutely an astonishing text. Now, if you are in, in any, um, I mean, most at least that I'm familiar with, queer studies programs, et cetera, this text is not even referred to. But it was such a crucial text as far as like how actual life was lived and what kind of a political example Duncan was able to set by his life. Um, no, he wasn't invited back. No, he was not invited back at all. Uh, he was definitely not invited back. But, but um, I don't know. I mean, to, to try to to try to respond to your question, I'm not. It, it, it's. Uh, I think. I think the projection of powerlessness and the projection of an impenetrable system is another means to to quell, you know, to quell participation, uh, essentially, and to quell you know uh, subservience. So I think that a lot of it is is self-imposed, you know. A lot of it is self-imposed, and there's no real, um, there's often no real mechanism that 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 is dictating certain kinds of behavior. It's very internalized. So I think the question becomes more: How does one? To what does one try? You know, to what end does one try to instigate or mobilize? For what purpose? And you know, I think that will vary tremendously in every in every instance. Um, so I'm not sure. It's not a satisfied. I'm not satisfied with my answer to your question. But I think you characterize very precisely what you know what's going on. But to to be thought through further, when something actually happens, which involves a specific instance, um, there's a narrative to it, and you either step up and say, well, yeah, you know, I saw this, or I defend this, or I, I'm there, you know, or, or, you, or you write it off in some netherworld where it becomes this kind of um, object, you know, that, 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 that is removed from, from 
from, I mean, I found that, I found that in that weird situation when I had that attack written in 2005, there were a bunch of writers who wrote these extremely lame responses, you know, to the place that, 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 that had attacked me. And, and the, they, they wrote another article called Dense Poet Society, which I actually agreed with. You know, which was even more unfortunate, because here are these people who are supposed to be defending you who are just completely clueless. You know, inst they were defending me like, I'm a nice guy and I'm not doing anybody any harm and all this stuff. Instead of saying, you know, isn't this great that, you know, that literature has this power, that culture has this power, that, it, that it's affecting, you know, that it's affecting public, public, public space, public representation, public gatherings, because that's what it was about, you know. I mean, and the attack was really, it wasn't even coded, it was very clear, you know, that it was about, I'm on such and such a board of whatever, which is funded by such and such, and I teach in a public university, and why should that be funded? You know, that's, you know, that's what the attack is about in the end. Um, so, yeah.